Welcome to Bladed Tech Musings, the channel dedicated to retro tech, innovation, science, and technological entertainment. June 23rd, 1941. Germany has occupied France for about a year following the successful counter invasion of May 1940. A rump collaborationist government run by French officials and headquartered in Vichy still runs about a third of France itself and all of its colonial territories. The government is headed by World War I war hero General Philip X, whose devil's bargain with Hitler exchanges the life and liberties of a significant portion of the pre-war French population for the superficial independence of the French state. 1.8 million French soldiers are held as slave labor by the Reich. 40,000 residents of Alsace-Lorraine are drafted directly into the Wehrmacht, and 80,000 Jews and political prisoners are deported to German death camps. In the midst of this insanity, from deep in the bowels of the French government bureaucracy, a report on the potential of ballistic missiles from a military engineer named Jean-Jacques Barry emerges. The report reaches the office of the Minister of Defense, Charles Usige, and is immediately classified top secret, and Barry is given a budget of 300,000 francs to begin development, all without the knowledge of the Germans. Usige is aware of German rocket development, wants a way to counter it even in the face of the inconvenient reality that France is occupied. Barry just needs funding for his rocket engine designs, but it is this moment, although neither Barry or Utzij knew it at the time, that marked the birth of French space exploration. Fourteen years earlier, Barry was attending a symposium being held by noted French aircraft designer Robert S. No Peltery when the speaker explained his dream of reaching outer space using rocket propulsion. Barry was galvanized and feverishly sketched a design for an interplanetary manned spacecraft and started a correspondence with Esno Peltery that would total 300 letters over six years. By 1930, Esno Peltery and Barry had persuaded the Ministry of War to fund a development of a sounding rocket as a first step. Their research laboratory opened a year later. Initial research concentrated on establishing the optimum propellant combinations and ratios for liquid rocket motors. When it was clear that even more money was needed, Barry obtained funding for development of rocket augmented anti-aircraft artillery shells, which he had calculated would double the performance of conventional shells. Five test shots of the design were carried out in early 1937. Promising test results led Barry to propose a tube-launched 240mm rocket with a range of 101 kilometers compared to 53 kilometers for a conventional artillery shell of the same gauge. Skeptical army brass rejected Barry's proposal outright, and Barry was officially reassigned to other projects. It was at this point that war interceded. Germany and the Soviet Union invaded Poland in September 1939, and France subsequently declared war and invaded Germany. Thirty French divisions advanced into the Saarland region, but before any significant progress was made, Polish resistance collapsed and Germany rushed military units back to their homeland's western territory. The army retreated back to the French border within a month, and an uneasy standoff ensued. France's timidity gave Germany time to plan a retaliatory invasion of its own. Six months later, the Wehrmacht flooded into Belgium and the Netherlands, flanking French Maginot defenses and trapping the bulk of the French army and the British Expeditionary Force in western Belgium. It was all over in less than three weeks. French government sued for peace and signed an armistice. The bulk of the French army was deported to forced labor camps, and all that was the Third Republic essentially ceased to exist. Except for Barry and his small staff. Barry labored on behind the scenes in obscurity, experimenting with rocket designs and fuels. Seven months after the collapse of the French army and the establishment of the Vichy regime, Barry completed a comprehensive report on the military potential of rocketry. He sketched out ballistic missiles with a 1,000km range, powered by liquid oxygen and gasoline engines. Armor-piercing rockets would reach 2,000 meters per second and defeat any tank armor. Anti-aircraft rockets would intercept aircraft at half the time as conventional AA weaponry. Rocket-boosted bombs would destroy enemy emplacements. Air-augmented rockets would reach even higher range and efficiencies, but would require extensive research to handle pressure and humidity variations. It was this report that would reach Utsij's desk in June 1941, and the report that would change history. Utsij wouldn't even see any of it, or even the end of World War II, 
as his plane would crash in November at the Vichy airport in bad weather. There were no survivors. Two days before the defense minister's death, Barry conducted his first engine test of his new surface-to-air rocket at the Lazark Plateau. The engine ran for 42 seconds before exploding. Additional funds were provided by the ministry, and a second test was run twice five months later in March of 1942. Both tests were brief and resulted in the destruction of the engines, but measurements showed a promising amount of thrust being produced. Thermal transfer from the engine to the missile structure was found to be the cause of the shortened tests, and changes were made. Testing was moved to Vancia outside of Lyon, and the test bench itself was rebuilt. Following short tests in July and August, the rocket engine finally endured a full duration run in September of 1942. Barry felt the missile was ready for a flight test, but this would have to be done in Algeria, away from the prying eyes of the Germans. By November 1942, a third of the test material was already in North Africa, and the team and the rest of the material was ready to embark at Marseille. Then news arrived of the Allied landings in North Africa. The flight tests were immediately called off, and the team hit all materials in Algeria and France. Even worse, within days the Germans occupied Vichy France, and all further work on the project was suspended. Barry thereafter joined the French resistance. As a result, word of Barry's rocket experiments reached Free French General Charles de Gaulle, and the government in exile persuaded Barry to send them any documentation he could get his hands on. In October 1943, Barry microfilmed the drawings of the rocket and smuggled them to Britain. The exact sequence of events leading up to this act is not clear, but the Gestapo got wind of Barry's activities and managed to detain some members of his team. One of them ironically died in a concentration camp where the inmates were assigned to V-2 rocket production. The Allies invaded France in June 1944, two months later overran Paris, resulting in its liberation and the triumphant ascendancy of de Gaulle's free French government in exile as a legitimate French government. Barry was immediately put to work. All the hidden materials were returned to Lyon and it was decided to conduct test launches from Toulon. The first launch of his rocket finally took place in March of 1945. The rocket, intended to make a 25 kilogram payload to 100 kilometers of altitude, veered off course and crashed after five seconds of flight. A second attempt the next day resulted in the rocket exploding on the launch pad, destroying it. Germany's surrender two months later allowed Barry and other French engineers to inspect equipment, parts, and drawings from the V-2 program. It was immediately evident that the V-2 was considerably more advanced than Barry's rocket, leading the French government to leapfrog Barry's development and concentrate on V-2-derived rockets. Nevertheless, Barry was conceded a contract to produce his design, which he called the EOL. With the surge in funding, Barry was finally able to identify the key issue behind the rocket's failures, a burn through and a loss of portion near the inner wall of the combustion chamber, which blocked the nozzle exit. With this issue addressed, the next static test of the EOL rocket went off without a hitch in 1946. Unfortunately, it was too late. EOL funding was cut back in favor of V2-related designs, and Barry's ability to advance the EOL's design slowed. After three years, the French government decided to cancel V2 development and retrace their steps. This lifted some pressure from Barry's EOL team. Static engine testing continued from 1949 to 1952. In November 1952, the EOL was finally re-cleared for launches. The first launch failed almost immediately after liftoff, but the rocket's second launch had the vehicle reaching three kilometers before failure. Three kilometers after 11 years of funding wasn't good enough. Competing programs were achieving better results from storable propellants, avoiding the problems Barry was having with liquid oxygen. In short, the French military did not see any future use for cryogenically fueled rockets. The EO project was shut down. As a result, Barry's impact on French rocket development dwindled. Barry became a consultant in the 1960s and then retired. He died on January 1st, 1978. Ironically, liquid oxygen, or LOX, became the mainstay in virtually every successful space rocket program, starting from the Soviet Union's Sputnik mission in 1957 and thereafter. In 2020, concurrent with this video, the SpaceX Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, the Boeing SLS, 
the United Launch Alliance Atlas V and the RKK Energia Soyuz rockets all use LOX in combination with other propellants. But perhaps more important was Barry's indirect contribution to Ariana Space's Ariane rockets, which for decades has been the primary lift vehicle in France and the European Space Agency. The Ariane 1 was developed from missile technology that was built on French and German rocket designs, designs aided by both the V2 program and Barry's EO development. What do you think about Barry's impact on the French space industry and the attribution of a portion of the Ariane rocket family's development to the engineer? Share with us by dropping a comment below. We hope you enjoyed this briefing on Barry and the EO rocket. If so, click that like button. We would like to take a moment to thank our subscribers for helping us reach the 3000 subscriber milestone. Not a subscriber yet? Clicking the subscribe button and the bell notification icon will help both our YouTube standing and keep you informed when new episodes are released. Links to our previous episodes can be found below. Stay connected by occasionally checking our Instagram feed, where we post content from our upcoming episodes and from episodes past that you may have missed. Make sure you follow our Twitter account, where all new episodes are announced. And finally, join us on our Facebook page, where we cover current news and events related to channel content. Thanks for watching.